So in our first session, uh, I asked you to reflect uh, about some questions. They're up on the screen now. How much do you know about Orthodox Christianity and its emphases? What are the insights of Orthodox Christianity that they might be utilized by we Western believers? What might have hindered the Slavic peoples having a reformation as the Catholic Western tradition did? And in the light of the current situation and conflict between Russia and Ukraine, do we understand how even Ukraine regards as demeaning the way Putin believes they're not a country, but merely part of his Russian Federation? Talking with some Ukrainian believers recently who are now refugees in Bradford, uh, they mentioned how Ukraine itself, which has always worked with the Orthodox calendar, which has, of course, Christmas uh, at the Feast of Epiphany, have now decided as a nation to change to the Western tradition as another way of distancing themselves from Putin's invasion. So we're going to turn now to Baptist beginnings in the Slavic East. There are several streams which come together to form the beginnings of Baptist life in Russia and Ukraine. No understanding of Baptist life in Ukraine and Russia can be adequate without a view of some of the key groups and influences which brought evangelical dissenting Christianity to Orthodox Eastern Europe. The first stream must be the work emanating from Hamburg of the great German Baptist leader, Johann Gerhard Onken. Onken was a son of a merchant in Hamburg, and he was sent by his father to Scotland to learn to be a trader. But in Scotland, he learned more than how to trade. He discovered deep biblical evangelical faith. A form of faith that he didn't know from his Lutheran background in Germany. Returning to Hamburg, a visiting American Baptist leader helped Onken to see the biblical imperative of believers' baptism. And in the year 1834, Onken was baptized with other evangelicals in the River Elba at Hamburg. The Hamburg Church, Baptist in background and tradition, grew rapidly. And it was soon sending believers to other parts of Europe. Onken's whole tradition was every Baptist a missionary. One of the places they sent missionaries to was the town of Memel. And we now know that as the city of Klaipeda in Lithuania. The logic of that is that Hamburg is a seaport and cooperated with other seaports around the North Sea and the Baltic Ocean. In 1841, Klaipeda was established as a Baptist community and began sending missionaries out themselves. The Memel Church soon had 27 outstations, preaching stations. And by the 1880s, there was a Baptistic community meeting in the city of St. Petersburg. One outstanding leader from this stream was William Fettler. And Fettler was given the chance to study at Spurgeon's College. And by 1908, they had created a formal Baptist church in St. Petersburg. Baptist life in Ukraine began to emerge in the 1860s in Kherson, that city which has just been returned to Ukrainian 
land as the Russian forces have retreated across the Dnieper River. The creation of these communities was initially by German Baptists who were migrating across Europe, taking with them their skills and work, but also every Baptist and missionary, their lively faith. Soon there was a flurry of church planting in southern and western Ukraine. Zaporizhia, another important area of Baptist activity. And here we take into account another key influencer, the British and Foreign Bible Society. Tsar Alexander II had given permission for the Baptist, uh, British and Foreign Bible Society to spread the Bible in his Russian Empire. And by 1870, part of the Old Testament had been translated into Ukrainian. The British and Foreign Bible Society used coal porters or Bible distributors. The BFBS told these coal porters they could only sell and hand out Bibles. They must not create churches. However, most of them engaged in evangelism. One man who started working in Tbilisi, Georgia, soon changed his spheres of operation to Ukraine. And the first Ukrainians were baptized in 1878. The influence of Byzantine Orthodox Christianity was soon being overshadowed in many of these places by the advancement of lively evangelical faith. In St. Petersburg, a key point was the development of Russian Baptist life through the upper classes. This capital city was the birth point for evangelical Christianity in the old Russia. Lord Radstock, who was a member of the Brethren, went to St. Petersburg in the 1870s, but invited by a noblewoman, Elzabita Cherkova. And in the salons of the wealthy and aristocrats, he was able to conduct Bible studies and expositions. Members of the aristocracy attended and, and were influenced, and the key person in this was Count Bobrinsky, Minister of Transportation. Another important attender was Count Vasily Pashkov of the elite Chevalier Guard. This group was non-denominational, influenced by the attitudes of Lord Radstock and his brethren upbringing. However, by the late 1870s, a man, Ivan Kargal, had become a key figure. He trained under Onken in Germany, and he was much more concerned with theology and ecclesiology than Lord Radstock had been. Initially, he was a member of a German-speaking congregation in the capital. But his influence and his theological reflections soon spread across the great Tsarist empire. Cargill was a deeply spiritual evangelical and set out his faith in a confession of 1913, which formed the basis of much of the faith of Baptists in all of the Slavic countries. In 1884, the Ukrainian Baptist communities came together and formed a Russian brackets empire, close of brackets, Baptist Union. Whilst the German Baptist missionaries had protection from Tsar Alexander, native peoples did not. Following the collapse of the old empire and the communist revolution, an all Ukrainian union of Baptists was formed and held its first conference in Kyiv in 1918. 
From 1918 to 1928, Ukrainian Baptists held five congresses and published their own Journal of Faith. Centres of importance were Odessa, which helped establish Moldovan Baptist life, Kherson, and of course, Kiev. But the Soviet communist authorities then decreed that these separate evangelical groups, such as the Ukrainian Baptist Union, had all to be amalgamated together and come under the control of the Minister of Cults. So the All Union Evangelical Baptist and Pentecostal community was brought into being by the Soviet authorities and a separate Ukrainian Baptist life was quashed from 1928 until the 1990s. This move of the Soviet communists to push together into one grouping, Pentecostal and National Baptist groups, led to a limitation on church life. The All Union Council of Evangelical Christian Baptists from the independent Baltic states, the countries of Armenia, Georgia, Belarus, Ukraine and Russia, and the stands were now to be allowed only to exist as one community. And in some of the countries of the Soviet communist world, there could only be one place where they could meet. So in Armenia, there was one community allowed to exist in the capital city, Yerevan. In the Baltic states, Baptist pastors were sent to Siberia and to the Gulags. There could be no children's work and many trades and professions, university places, etc., were not open to believers. Baptist life in Ukraine which had grown from separate beginnings thanks to the work of the BFBS and the German Baptist missionaries, was now absorbed in this new communist created reality. Baptist life, first established at Memel in Lithuania and the network of mission stations from Hamburg, was now brought together in one community. How do we react to the work of the Cole Porters? Told they could only distribute Bibles. They in fact did what the BFBS forbid them to do and evangelized and created churches. Whereas British Baptists concentrated on foreign missions in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean, we note that German Baptists concentrated on evangelizing Eastern Europe. Was one right and one wrong? Or were both appropriate for the age? What outcomes does this lead to in our own generation? And then perhaps from Radstock, can the gospel survive simply as a preached word? Radstock would do nothing other than conduct Bible studies and preach. In the end, was the German approach right? We need an ecclesiology of theology and somebody like Kargel, who created all that for the Baptists of the old Russian Empire. And what difference does a dissenting evangelical church exhibit if it's fostered in the soil of a state church, which is an eclectic theological mix like the Church of England, or more uniform in the way it works like the Orthodox Church? These are things for us to think about. Thank you.